my dear students welcome to jnana taranga cet coaching classes for medical and neat entrance examination 2018-19 conducted by department of pre university education karnataka myself suresh babu today i am going to explain you about uh, second pc physical chemistry chapters solid state and solutions come to the first chapter the solid state see matter is nothing but anything which occupies some space and having some mass it may exist in three states solids liquids and gases now we are going to discuss about uh, solids solids have different shape and different volume these solids are mainly divided into three types sorry two types crystalline solids and amorphous solids the basic difference among these are shape arrangement of the particles melting point cleavage property heat of fusion anisotropy and their nature crystalline solids have definite geometric shape whereas amorphous solids are not having a definite geometric shape crystalline solids have long range orders whereas amorphous solids are not having long range orders crystalline solids have sharp melting points amorphous solids are not having sharp melting points crystalline solids undergo clear cleavage when cut with a sharp edge whereas amorphous solids does not undergo clear cleavage when cut with a sharp edge crystalline solids are having definite heat of fusion whereas amorphous solids are not having definite heat of fusion crystalline solids are anisotropy whereas amorphous solids are isotropic in nature crystalline solids are true solids whereas amorphous solids are super cold liquids and come to the next one types of crystalline solids crystalline solids are mainly classified into three types sorry four types molecular solids ionic solids metallic solids and covalent or network solids if you see a molecular solids are further divided into three types non polar molecular solids polar molecular solids and hydrogen bond molecular solids in molecular solids the constituent particles are molecules the attractive forces between the molecules are either london forces or dipole dipole forces or hydrogen bonding and these molecular solids are generally soft in nature except that hydrogen bonded solids which are hard they possess low melting points they are bad conductors of electricity ionic solids contains uh, the constituent particles ions these are attracted by coulombic attractive forces they are hard and brittle and they possess high melting points these are bad conductors in solid state but good conductors in uh, solution and molten state uh, metallic solids contains uh, the constituent particles are metal ions these are held by metallic bonding these are hard but malleable and ductile they have moderate to high melting points these are uh, good conductors of heat and electricity in covalent solids the constituent particles are atoms which are bonded by covalent bonds these are hard they have very high melting points these are insulators except graphite which is a good conductor of electricity so this is regarding uh, different types of crystalline solids come to the next one uh, unit cell unit cell is the smallest repeating unit of the crystalline lattice having the shape of the crystal which when repeated in three dimensions having the which gives the crystal lattice and this unit cell can be characterized by two parameters one is side and there is angle between the sides these sides are generally represented by a comma b and c and angles are represented by alpha beta and gamma and we are having a mainly four types of unit cells they are primitive body centered face centered and end centered the primitive unit cell contains the constituent particles only at corners body centered cubic lattice contains constituent particles at corners and body center face centered unit cell contains the constituent particles at corners and face centers the edge center unit cell contains the particles at corner and any two opposite edge centers these are the four types of unit cells come to the crystal systems there are mainly seven types of crystal systems and these seven types of crystal systems contains 14 types of crystal lattices what we call them as brevis lattices 
if it is a cubic system, the parameters are a is equal to b is equal to c, alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma is equal to 90 and this cubic system contains three types of unit cells, primitive, body centered and face centered. The second one is tetragonal system, the parameters are a is equal to b is not equal to c, alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma is equal to 90, this contains uh, two types of lattices, simple and body centered. The orthorhombic system, the parameters are a is not equal to b is not equal to c, alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma is equal to 90, this contains uh, four unit cells, simple, body centered, face centered and end centered. Next one hexagonal crystal system. This contains only one type of lattice and the parameters are a is equal to b not equal to c, alpha is equal to beta is equal to 90 whereas gamma is equal to 120. And next one monoclinic. The monoclinic parameters are a is not equal to b is not equal to c, alpha is equal to beta is equal to sorry gamma is equal to 90 but beta is not equal to 90. This contains uh, two types of lattices simple and end centered. Next one are trigonal. The parameters are a is equal to b is equal to c, alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma which is not equal to 90, this contains only one type of lattice. And last one is uh, triclinic, a is not equal to b is not equal to c, alpha is not equal to beta is not equal to gamma is, equal, is not equal to 90. So these are uh, total 7 types of crystal systems which, contain, which contains 14 types of lattices. Out of these the most symmetric is cubic system, the most unsymmetric is triclinic system. Whereas orthorhombic system contains uh, more number of types of lattices. This is regarding uh, types of previous lattices. Come to the next one. The contribution of the particles present in a unit cell. Corner. There are 8 corners for a cubic system and the contribution of each particle is 1 by 8. 2 face centers, contribution of each particle is 1 by 2. 4 edge centers and contribution of each particle is 1 by 4. Body center total particle belongs to unit cell and coming to the number of uh, atoms per unit cell in the cubic lattice, come to primitive unit cell, this contains uh, 8 particles, 8 corners and the contribution is uh, 1, face center unit cell, this contains 8 corners and 6 face centers, the contribution of corner particles is 1 and face center particles is 3, total is 4. Body center unit cell, this contains 8 corners whose contribution is 1 and one body center whose contribution is 1 and the total number of particles in a unit cell is 2. And coming to the next one, the close packing of the constant particles in a one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions. Here what the diagram shown here, so these are the close packing in two dimensions. Come to this uh, first one, this first one shows the two dimensional square close packing. If you observe here, one constant particle is surrounded by four constant particles. So, the coordination number of the particle is four. Coming to the second types of crystal system, if one dimensional pattern arrangement over that, another layer is placed in such a way that the depressions of the first layer is covered, then we can get this type of arrangement. This is called as a hexagonal close packing. In this hexagonal close packing, this is one constant particle. This constant particle is surrounded by six constant particles. So, the coordination number of the particle is nothing but 6. So, overall for two dimensional square close packing the coordination number is 4, for two dimensional hexagonal close packing the coordination number is 6. Come to the next one. This is the arrangement of constant particles in three dimensions. Over the two dimensional hexagonal close packing, if you place second layer in the depressions of the first layer, then this is the type of arrangement what we will get. And here if you observe two types of wires is present. One is represented as T, another is represented as O. T represents tetrahedral void, O represent octahedral void. So, the tetrahedral void is obtained here when three layers of one sphere are covered with the one sphere of the next layer. This type of void is called as a tetrahedral void. And second type of void is octahedral void. This type of octahedral voids are obtained when two triangular voids having the vertex in opposite direction of the two layers are in contact with each other at the center what the wide place is present here, this is called as octahedral wide. These are the two types of wires, tetrahedral wires and octahedral wires. And coming to this uh, another diagram, this is the two dimensional, three dimensional arrangement of the constant particles. See, this middle one indicates the arrangement of the second layer over the first layer in the depressions of the first layer in order to cover the depressions. 
Now, over this uh, second layer, you can place third layer in two ways in order to cover the tetrahedral voids and in order to cover the octahedral voids. If you place the third layer, see this diagram, in this, I have placed this uh, third layer in order to cover the tetrahedral voids of the second layer, then the third layer is exactly similar to first layer, which is observed here in this diagram. This is the first layer, this is the second layer and this is the third layer. This third layer and first layer are exactly similar to each other. That means, the two layers are repeated here, which is called as ABAB type closed packing. This is nothing but a hexagonal closed packing. Now, come to this diagram here. In this, in the octahedral voids of the second layer, third layer is placed. So, this third layer is not coincide either with the first layer or second layer, which is entirely different from both the layers. And over this third layer, we can place one more layer that can coincide with the first layer. So, here uh, three layers are repeated, which is called ABC, ABC type arrangement. And this type of closed packing gives uh, cubic closed packing or face centered cubic lattice. See the same in one more also you can difference here. Here, this is hexagonal closed packing. A constant particle in the hexagonal closed packing in the same plane is in contact with the six spheres. In the above plane is in contact with three spheres. In the below plane is in contact with three spheres. So, the overall coordination number is 12. This is the arrangement in three dimensional direction. And come to this next one cubic closed packing or FCC lattice. Here, three layers are repeated and this gives a face centered cubic lattice arrangement. This is the arrangement of constant particles in three dimensional pattern. And this is the overall representation still now what we discussed, non closed packing and closed packing. First one is a primitive cubic. In primitive cubic lattice, each particle is in contact with the six nearest neighboring particles, so coordination number is 6. And here in this packing, the same layer is repeated, so it is represented as AA type closed packing. And second one is body centered cubic closed packing. In body centered cubic closed packing, each constant particle is surrounded by 8 constant particles and the repeating pattern is nothing but AB, AB and so on. And coming to cubic closed packing as well as hexagonal closed packing, which is the closest packing in the crystal lattices. In these two packing, the coordination number of the constant particles is 12. Hexagonal closed packing has AB, AB type arrangement, whereas cubic closed packing has ABC, ABC type arrangement. And come to the next one, location of tetrahedral voids and octahedral voids and how many tetrahedral voids and octahedral voids are present in an unit cell. Now, this is the unit cell which is nothing but a face centered cubic lattice. So, in this diagram, if you observe here, in the small part, these are the particles of the two opposite face centers, two opposite uh, edge centers. If you join these, uh, we can get an arrangement nothing but uh, which is having the tetrahedral geometry if you observe here clearly this is the tetrahedral geometry here. And here, if you take uh, one particle here, this is the location of the particle which is present here, that is called tetrahedral void. And coming to the next diagram here, this is the location of uh, octahedral void. The octahedral voids are located at a uh, body center, this is a uh, body center and at edge center. A cube has one body center and 12 edge centers and the contribution of the particle at the body center total belongs to unit cell whereas edge center particle contributes only 1 by 4 through unit cell and this is the contribution of uh, particles towards the unit cell. And now, if a system contains uh, n particles, then the number of octahedral voids possible is n, whereas the number of tetrahedral possible is 2n. So, this is regarding a uh, number of tetrahedral voids and octahedral voids present in a unit cell. And this is the overall description still now what we discussed. A simple cubic lattice contains uh, 8 lattice points, one particle belongs to unit cell, coordination number is 6 and the radius of the particle is equal to A by 2 and the nearest neighboring distance is nothing but A. The packing efficiency is pi by 6 which is 0 0.52 and packing efficiency is uh, 52 percent and the white space is 48 percent. Coming to face centered cubic lattice, number of particles in unit cell is 14, number of particles present in unit cell is 4, coordination number 12 radius of the particle is equal to A by 2 root 2, nearest neighboring distance is A by 2 and the packing efficiency is 0 0.74 which is root 2 pi by 6, nothing but 74 percent and the vacant space is 26 percentage. Body centered cubic lattice contains 9 constant particles, out of these uh, 2 particles belongs to unit cell, the coordination number is 8, the radius of the constant particle is root 3A by 4 and the nearest neighboring distance is root 3A by 2, the packing efficiency is uh, root 3 pi by 8 which is equal to 0 0.8. Uh, 6, 8. So, packing efficiency is 68 percent and vacant space is 32 percent. This is regarding the complete description regarding a simple 
face centered cubic and body centered cubic lattice. Come to the density of units. Density is nothing but mass by volume. Volume is A cube, whereas the mass of the unit cell is Zm by A naught. Then the density of the unit cell will be Zm by A naught A cube. This is the formula which is used to calculate uh, density of unit cell as well as molecular mass of a solid, means that is an element. And come to the next one, crystal defects. So, there are uh, mainly three types of crystal defects, which are nothing but stoichiometric defects, non stoichiometric defects and impurity defects. Come to the first one, uh, stoichiometric defects. Again, these stoichiometric defects can be observed in uh, covalent compounds as well as in ionic compounds. And here, this is the diagram which indicates uh, the stoichiometric defects which are observed in uh, covalent solids. The first type is vacancy defect and the second type is uh, interstitial defect. So, if you observe this first diagram, vacancy defect, here one of the constituent particle is missed from the lattice. Here, no particle is present here. So, because of the missing of the particle, this is called as vacancy defect. And because of this type of defects, the density of the lattice decreases. Come to the next one, uh, interstitial defects. Here, all regular constant particles are present in their original positions. Along with that, here one more particle is located here as well as here. Means, some extra particles are present in the unit cell. Because of the presence of these extra particles, the density of the lattice increases. These are the two types of stoichiometric defects, what is observed in uh, covalent compounds. Coming to stoichiometric defects in uh, ionic compounds, there are mainly of two types, short key defects and Frenkel defects. In case of uh, short key defects, equal number of cations and anions are missed from the lattice. So, let us here, let us assume this is a negative particle which is the larger one and this is the positive particle which is the smaller one. And here, these two particles, the negative particle and a positive particle is missing from the lattice. As a result, there is no change in the stoichiometry of the lattice and an overall electrical neutrality is also maintained here. So, this type of defects are called as short key defects. The condition to exhibit short key defect is the given crystalline solid uh, there is ionic crystal should contain a high coordination number. This is the basic condition required and the size of the particle should be nearly same. Come to the next one now, uh, Frankel defects. So, this is also observed in ionic compounds, where there is a large difference in size of uh, cation and anion. And one more condition required for Frankel defects is, these Frankel defects are observed in the ionic crystals with low coordination number. So, in case of this uh, Frankel defect, no particle is removed from the lattice, but see here, one particle is missed from the regular lattice and that particle occupies uh, an interstitial site. As a result, there is no change in the density of the lattice as well as electrical neutrality also maintained. So, these are the major type of defects that are observed in uh, ionic solids which are stoichiometric, short key defect and Frankel defect. Some solids if you take like AgBr, they can exhibit both uh, short key defects as well as uh, Frankel defects also. And coming to the next one, uh, non stoichiometric defects. These non stoichiometric defects are of two types metal excess defect and metal deficiency defects. Again, metal excess defects is of uh, due to two reasons. One is due to the anionic vacancy and another one is due to the extra cation present in the lattice. Come to this uh, first diagram here. Here, one of the anion is missing from the lattice. As a result, the number of cations in the lattice is more, but the electrical neutrality is disturbed. So, in order to maintain electrical neutrality here, that anionic vacancy is occupied by an electron, an electron is occupied here and this electron maintains the electrical neutrality of the lattice. Since non-metal ions are less, this is called as a metal excess defect due to anionic vacancy. And come to this uh, second one, here if you observe, all the constant particles are present in their lattice, but an extra cation is occupied in the lattice here. If an extra cation is occupied in the lattice, then electrical neutrality is disturbed. In order to maintain the electrical neutrality, one more particle uh, that is an electron occupies its interstitial state. As a result, electrical neutrality is maintained. And coming to this uh, once metal excess defects, 
here what the electron occupied here in anionic dependent anionic vacancy this is called as a f center and these f centers are nothing but a called as electrons occupying the anionic vacancy and these f centers are responsible for the color properties of the ionic compounds these electrons undergo excitation and excitation as a result they can exhibit color so these are the metal excess defects due to anionic vacancies and one more type of defect is their metal deficiency defects this type of defects are observed when a metal ion has the ability to exhibit two or more oxidation states in this case one of the ion is missed from the lattice but in order to maintain the electrical neutrality the neighboring atoms can satisfy the higher oxidation number exhibit higher oxidation number and they can uh, maintain the electrical neutrality so this type of uh, defects are observed in uh, hematite which is fe2 o3 there the lattice contains both fe2 as well as fe3 ions this is metal deficiency defects these are also called as non stoichiometric defects and come to the next one impurity defects so if a crystal is allowed to crystallize in the presence of another crystal some of the metal ions are missed from the lattice and that cationic sites are occupied by the another metal ion and this diagram shows a nasa lattice where some of the na plus ions if you observe here here and here two na plus ions are removed by one strontium ion but out of the two sites only one site is occupied by strontium and another site is vacancy that means uh, here an extra atom is introduced means a foreign atom is introduced an impurity is introduced into the lattice by replacing the native atoms in the crystal lattice so this type of defects are called as impurity defects and coming to the electrical property of the solids depending on electrical conductivity solids are divided into three types conductors semiconductors and insulators conductors are having the range of conductivity in between 10 power 4 to 10 power 7 ohm inverse and meter inverse semiconductors are having the conductivity range 10 power minus 6 to 10 power 4 ohm inverse meter inverse whereas insulators are having a very low conductivity in the range of 10 power minus 20 to 10 power minus 10 see this conductivity of these solids can be explained based on the band theory of solids according to this band theory the atomic orbitals uh, combine with each other and forms uh, two sets of molecular orbital one set of molecular orbital is having lower energy which contains uh, electrons another set of uh, orbitals is having higher energy which are vacant now there exists some energy gap between the two bands what we call them as uh, forbidden zone and depending on this forbidden zone these uh, solids are of two types sorry three types insulators semiconductors and conductors come to this first case here in this diagram both valence band and conduction band are overlap with each other is here this is the overlapping region where valence band and conduction band overlap with each other as a result the electrons can move easily from valence band to conduction band so these can access good conductors of electricity now come to this one semiconductors there is a small energy gap between the valence band and conduction band so electrons here also can move from valence band to conduction band and they can conduct electricity but in case of insulators there is a large gap between valence band and conduction band so from here to here the electrons cannot move easily as a result the electrical conductivity is very less now in this chapter we are going to discuss regarding uh, semiconductors see semiconductors are of two types intrinsic semiconductors and uh, extrinsic semiconductors the semiconductivity of a pure substance is nothing but called intrinsic semiconductors if an intrinsic semiconductor is doped with another atom then we can get extrinsic semiconductors depending on the nature of the doping atom these extrinsic semiconductors are divided into two types they are n type semiconductors and p type semiconductors so this n type semiconductors are obtained whenever silicon or germanium is doped with a pentavalent impurity nothing but a 15th group elements here the electrical conductivity is mainly due to negative charge nothing but electrons that's why these are called as n type semiconductors and one more type is p type semiconductors these are obtained when silicon is doped with a 
13 group elements like aluminum, gallium, indium. So, here this aluminum is not having a sufficient number of electrons to form the bonds with the silicon atoms which contains a vacant orbital what we call them as a hole which is considered as a positive charge that is why it is called as a p type semiconductor. Right. Now, coming to magnetic properties. The magnetic property of is mainly due to spin of the electron and due to the orbital motion. Depending on the magnetic nature, the solids are divided into three to five types dia, para, ferro, anti ferro, and ferrimagnetic. Dia are repelled by magnetic field, para are weakly attracted by magnetic field. In case of ferromagnetic substances, if you observe here, the what represent the arrows here, these represents uh, magnetic domains. All magnetic domains are aligned in the same direction, which are ferromagnetic substances. Magnetic domains are aligned in a parallel and anti parallel direction in equal number, which is called uh, anti ferromagnetic materials. Mag domains are aligned in parallel as well as in anti parallel direction in unequal number, these are called uh, ferromagnetic materials. So, this is regarding a uh, synopsis of this chapter. Now, come to the first question. The given question is which of the following statements about amorphous solids is incorrect? Now, only we discuss regarding uh, differences between amorphous solids and crystalline solids. The first option is they melt over a range of temperature, this is the correct statement because amorphous solids are not having sharp melting points. They melt, they, range, they can melt over a range of temperatures, this statement is correct. They are isotropic, so this is the wrong statement here because amorphous solids are uh, isotropic in nature. Come to third one, there is no orderly arrangement of particles, this statement is correct. They are rigid and incompressible because uh, solids are rigid and incompressible both crystalline as well as amorphous solids. So, this statement also correct. So, the wrong statement is nothing but a second statement. So, our answer is uh, 2. And come to the next one. Which of the following uh, is a covalent crystal? The first option is a rock salt. See, rock salt is nothing but uh, NaCl. This contains constant particle Na plus and Cl minus which is ionic crystal. Ice. Ice contains water molecules which are bonded by hydrogen bond. This is a covalent crystal. Quartz. The quartz formula is uh, silica SiO2. In this, uh, each silicon is surrounded by four oxygen atoms in tetrahedral geometry by covalent bonds. This is a covalent solid. Whereas dry ice, dry is nothing but a solid CO2. This is a covalent solid. Sorry, this is a molecular solid. So our answer is uh, quartz silica, which is nothing but third option. And come to the next one. The unit cell. Uh, with uh, crystallographic dimensions A is not equal to B is not equal to C and axial angles alpha is equal to gamma is equal to 90 whereas beta is not equal to 90. The given options are monoclinic, tetragonal, triclinic and orthorhombic. Here the parameters given clearly for monoclinic it is A is not equal to B is not equal to C and alpha is equal to gamma is equal to 90 comma beta is not equal to 90. For uh, tetragonal A is equal to B is not equal to C alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma is equal to 90 for triclinic A is equal not equal to B not equal to C, alpha not equal to beta not equal to gamma not equal to 90. For orthorhombic A is not equal to B is not equal to C and alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma is equal to 90. So, the given parameters are coincide with uh, the monoclinic crystal system. So, our answer is the first option. Come to the next one. Which type of crystal contains more than one type of previous lattices? See, if you take a hexagonal system, it contains only one type of lattice. Triclinic system contains one type of lattice, rhomboidal contains one type of lattice, whereas monoclinic contains two types of lattices, there is a primitive unit cell and n centered unit cell. So, our answer is uh, fourth option monoclinic. And come to the next one. In tetragonal system, which of the following is true? And the given options are all axial lengths and axial angles are equal, second one is all the three axial lengths are equal. Third one is all the three axial angles are equal. Fourth one is uh, two axial angles are equal, but the third is different. So, if you take the parameters of tetragonal, A is equal to B is not equal to C, alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma is equal to 90. So, here two lengths are equal, all axial angles are equal. Come to the first statement, all axial lengths and axial angles are equal, this is the wrong statement. All three axial lengths are equal. Here only two axial lengths are equal, third is not equal, this is also wrong statement. 
all three axial angles are equal here all three axial angles are equal so this is the correct option and come to the fourth one two axial angles are equal but here three axial angles are equal so our answer is third option and come to the next question the most unsymmetrical system and symmetrical systems are the given options are tetragonal and cubic triclinic and cubic rhombohedral and hexagonal orthorhombic and cubic now if you see the parameters here uh, for a triclinic system a is not equal to b is not equal to c alpha is not equal to beta is not equal to gamma is not equal to 90 all lengths as well as angles are entirely different so there is a most unsymmetric system in cubic system all lengths as well as all angles are equal to one another so this is the most symmetric system so our answer is a triclinic and cubic which is a second option and come to the next one the close packing sequence a b a b is represents the first option is simple cubic second option is fcc packing third one is hexagonal close packing and fourth one is bcc packing since cubic uh, simple cubic uh, close packing we will have an arrangement of a a type arrangement this is the first option in fcc arrangement we can get a b c a b c type of arrangement in case of uh, hexagonal system we will get a b a b type of arrangement so here our answer is a b a b type arrangement which is nothing but a hexagonal close packing so the answer is third option and come to the next one a compound is found by two elements a and b atoms of a are at the corners of the cube and uh, b atoms are at the face centers the formula of the compound is the first option is a b second option is a b 3 third option is a 2 b and fourth option is uh, a 3 b see atoms of a are present at eight corners and contribution of each corner is 1 by 8 so number of particles is 8 into 1 by 8 which is equal to 1 atoms of b are present at uh, six face centers contribution of face center is 1 by 2 so the total number of particles is equal to 6 into 1 by 2 which is equal to 3 so one atom of a and three atoms of b are present so the formula is uh, a 1 b 3 which is equal to a b 3 so among the given options the second option is the correct answer here and coming to the next question in an alloy of metals a comma b and c a forms fcc lattice b occupies the center of each edge and c is present at the center of the lattice the formula of the alloy is now see here a forms fcc lattice means a is present at eight corners and six space centers so if you calculate the contribution of eight corners and six space centers we can get a 8 into 1 by 8 plus 6 into 1 by 2 which is equal to 4 atoms here and B occupies a center of the edge there are 12 edges for a cubic system and contribution of the particle at the edge center is 1 by 4 so the 12 edge contributions is nothing but 12 into 1 by 4 which is equal to 3 atoms since C occupies at the center see the particle at the center cannot share with any other unit cells the total particle belongs to unit cell only so 1 into 1 which is equal to 1 atom so number of atoms of a is 4 b is 3 and c is equal to 1 so a 4 b 3 c 1 hence the formula is a 4 b 3 c so our answer is the fourth option a 4 b 3 c and come to the next one in a solid a b having NaCl structure a atoms occupy the corners of the cubic unit cell if all the face centered atoms along the one of the axis are removed then the resident stoichiometry of the solid is the given options are a b 2 a 2 b a 4 b 3 a 3 b 4 see in NaCl type of structures one type of particles occupies uh, corners and face centers another type of particles occupies uh, body center and edge center now here i have taken here a atoms are present at eight corners and six face centers so b atoms are present at one body center and all edge centers and now in this we have eliminated the particle along the one of the axis means we have eliminated uh, two face center particles along one axis two face centers are present so we have eliminated two face centers then remaining face centers are only four so a particles are present at eight corners and six face centers so its contribution if you calculate eight into corner contribution one by eight plus four into face center contribution one by two total will be three atoms of a are present in unit cell now coming to atoms of b 
So, one body center and two edge centers are there. So, body center contribution is 1, 1 into 1, two edge center contribution is 1 by 4, so 12 into 1 by 4 which is equal to 4. So, on the total we are having uh, 3 atoms of A and 4 atoms of B. So, the formula is uh, A 3 B 4, so our answer is uh, the fourth option. Come to the next one. The number of tetrahedral and octahedral voids per unit cell of cubic closed packed structure is? As we know that the cubic closed packing contains uh, 4 atoms present in the unit cell and if a system contains n particles, number of tetrahedral voids will be 2n and number of octahedral voids will be n. Then the given FCC lattice contains uh, 4 atoms present in the unit cell, so number of uh, tetrahedral voids is equal to 8 and number of octahedral voids is equal to 4. So, the answer is uh, third option 8 comma 4. And coming to the next question, A forms HCP lattice and B are occupying one third of the tetrahedral voids. Then the formula of the compound is, the options are AB, A3B2, A2B3 and AB4. So, here uh, let the number of uh, atoms of A in HCP lattice is X and B atoms are occupying one third of tetrahedral voids. Since number of atoms of A is X, total number of tetrahedral voids will be 2X, in that only one third is occupied by B, so number of atoms of B will be 2X by 3. So, now the molecular formula is AX B 2X by 3. If you cancel X and X and if you simplify that, you will get the formula A 3 B 2. So, the answer will be second option A 3 B 2. And now, coming to the next question. See, every atom or ion that forms an FCC unit cell is surrounded by, the options are 6 octahedral voids, 8 tetrahedral voids, 8 octahedral voids and 6 tetrahedral voids. Third one is 6 octahedral voids and 6 tetrahedral voids. Fourth one is 8 octahedral voids and 4 tetrahedral voids. See, if you take a one cubic system here, just I am going to draw a simple diagram here. So, this is the cubic system. So, if you take a, a corner particle, so this corner particle is in contact with a, like this, you can represent, this is one edge center, this is one edge center, this is one edge center, this is here one edge center, this is one edge center and here we can get one edge center. That means, this is in contact with the six edge centers, that means it is in contact with a, six octahedral voids, edge center is nothing but octahedral void. So, the particle at the corner is in contact with uh, six edge centers, there is a eight, so there is a six octahedral voids. Now, in addition to this, this corner particle is in contact with the tetrahedral void which is present inside the unit cell and this corner is shared with the eight unit cells, so it is in contact with the eight tetrahedral units in eight unit cells. That means, a given particle in FCC lattice is in contact with uh, 6 octahedral voids and 8 tetrahedral voids. So, our answer is the first option. Come to the next question. The first 3 nearest neighboring distance for a body centered cubic lattice are, all right. Now, you see here, I will take a one simple BCC lattice structure here. In BCC lattice, the particles are present at uh, 8 corners and body center. Actually, these particles are all in contact with each other, there is no gap between the constituent particles. Just for simplicity, I will draw like this. Now, our question is, the first three nearest neighboring distance for body centered cubic lattice is, right. So, here, these are the two particles which are in contact with each other here. The total body diagonal length is equal to root 3a. Then, in this half of the length is nothing but root 3a by 2. This is the first nearest neighboring distance between the constituent particles in a BCC lattice. The next nearest neighboring particles are the particles which are present at the corners of an edge. Since edge length is A, the nearest neighboring distance is A between the two particles. And the third nearest neighboring distance is nothing but uh, the phase diagonal particles. This is the third nearest neighboring particles. As you know that the phase diagonal is equal to root 2a. So, 
the first nearest neighboring particles are corner and body center the second nearest neighboring particles are uh, edge center particles the third nearest neighboring particles are two corner particles of a face diagonal so the answer is the first nearest neighboring distance root 3a by 2 second nearest neighboring distance is a and third nearest neighboring distance is root a so our answer is the third option and come to the next one if a stands for the edge length of the cubic system then the result sorry the radius of the spheres in the simple bcc and fcc lattice will be so if you take a simple cubic lattice for simple cubic lattice edge length is equal to 2r then radius of the particle is equal to a by 2 in case of body diagonal the particles are in contact with uh, each other on body diagonal the body diagonal length is equal to root 2 3a which is equal to 4 times of the radius then radius of the particle is root 3a by 4 in a phase centered cubic lattice the phase diagonal particles are in contact with each other the phase diagonal length is root 2a which is equal to 4r then radius of the particle is equal to root 2a by 4 which is equal to a by 2 root 2 so our answer is a by 2 root 3a by 4 and a by 2 root 2 so here the third option is the correct answer and come to the next one lithium forms body centered cubic lattice the edge length of the side of the unit cell is 351 picometers the atomic radius of the lithium will be see here the given lattice is body centered cubic lattice for body centered cubic lattice the relation between edge length and radius is r is equal to root 3a by 2 here the edge length value is given as a 351 picometers and by substituting this 351 in this relation and on simplifying you will get a value of 152 picometers so the answer is the fourth option 152 picometers coming to the next one the edge length of fcc unit cell is 600 picometers if the radius of cation is 180 picometers the radius of the anion would be right see in case of uh, ionic crystals which are having NaCl type of lattice if you take uh, an edge length the edge length contains uh, one type of ion at the center let it be cation and one particle here as well as here these are anions this is one radius from here to here this is radius this is radius and this is radius that means the total edge length a is equal to two times of radius of anion plus two times of radius of cation now the same i have equalized here edge length is equal to two times of radius of cation and anion the edge length given is 600 picometers and cation radius is given as 180 picometers by substituting edge length and cation radius value and on simplifying you can get radius of anion as 120 picometers so our answer is third option and coming to the next question calculate the number of unit cells in a cubic crystal NaCl weighing 0 0.585 grams and given atomic mass of sodium is 23 and chlorine is 35.5 so if you know uh, one unit cell contains four NaCl units then one mole contains four moles of NaCl one mole means nothing but Avogadro number which is 6.0 into 10 power 23 so 6.023 into 10 power 23 unit cells are present in 4 into 58.5 grams of NaCl then how many number of unit cells are present in a given mass 0 0.585 grams and just on cross multiplying this we will get the answer here as uh, 1.5 into 10 power 21 unit cells so our answer is the first option 1.5 into 10 power 21 unit cells and next one a b crystallizes in body centered cubic lattice with a edge length equal to 387 picometers the distance between the two oppositely charged ions in the lattice is see the distance between the two oppositely charged ions is nothing but the nearest neighboring distance the nearest neighboring distance for a bcc lattice is nothing but equal to root 3a by 2 and here given already the edge length value given as a 387 picometers by substituting that uh, edge length in this formula root 3a by 2 if you simplify you will get the answer as uh, 355 picometers so our answer is the first option and coming to the next question the density of sorry the density and edge length of crystalline element with fcc lattice are 10 grams per centimeter cube and 400 picometers respectively the atomic mass of the element is 
the given options are 32, 64, 96 and 128. As you know that the formula for calculating density of the lattice is Zm by Na A cube, where Z is number of atoms present in itself. Since the given lattice is FCC lattice, number of atoms present in itself is equal to 4 and here we have to calculate the atomic mass, then uh, atomic mass is equal to density into Avogadro number into A cube by Z. And on substituting the values by converting edge length in terms of uh, centimeters, then we can get, because density is given in uh, grams per centimeter cube. So, first of all you should convert this uh, picometers into centimeter and then if you substitute in this really given relation, then we will get uh, atomic mass as 96 grams per centimeter cube. So, our answer is third option. And come to the next question, which of the following is incorrect statement? The first option is density decreases in case of uh, crystals with the short key defects. And second option is Fe 0 0.980 has non stoichiometric metal deficiency defect. And third one is F center generation is responsible factor for importing the color of the crystal. And fourth one is Frenkel defects are favored in those ionic compounds in which the size of cation and anion are equal. Now, coming to the first option, density decreases in case of uh, short key defects. This is correct one. Why? Because in short key defects, some particles are missing from the lattice. As a result, the density of the lattice decreases. So, the first statement is given is correct. And come to the second one, Fe 0 0.980 has a non stoichiometric metal deficiency defect. So, if you observe this formula clearly, Fe 0 0.980, here number of metal atoms are less as compared to non metal atoms. So, this is a metal deficiency defect and there is no stoichiometry. So, this statement also correct. And come to the third one, F centers, which are nothing but electrons occupying the anionic vacancies. These electrons can undergo excitation and de-excitation. As a result, they can import a color to the given crystal. So, this statement also correct. And coming to the fourth one, Frenkel defects are favored in those ionic compounds in which the size of the cation and anion are equal. This is the wrong one. Why? Because Frankel defects are more favored in crystals which contains low coordination number and there is a large difference between the size of cation and anion, but the given is anion and cation are having equal sizes. So, this is a wrong statement. So, our answer is uh, the fourth option. And coming to the next question, doping of AgCl crystal with cadmium chloride results in, then what is meant by doping? Doping means nothing but the introducing a foreign atom into the lattice. There is nothing more called as doping. So, when AgCl is allowed to crystallize with uh, cadmium chloride, then we can observe some type of defects. Then among the given which is correct option they have asked here. The first one is short key defects, second one is Frenkel defects, third one is cationic vacancy defect and fourth one is the formation of F centers. See when AgCl is doped with cadmium chloride, one cadmium ion, if the cadmium valence is uh, Cd plus 2 and a silver valence is Az plus 1. So, one cadmium ion is equal to two silver ions. So, one cadmium can replace uh, two silver ions, but out of the two sides only one side is occupied. As a result, number of metal ions in the lattice will be less. So, it is nothing but uh, a cationic vacancy defect. So, our answer is the third option, cationic vacancy defect. And coming to the next question. If NaCl is doped with a 10 power minus 4 mole percent of strontium chloride, the concentration of the cationic vacancies per mole will be, the given options are 6.02 into 10 power 16, 6.02 into 10 power 17, 6.02 into 10 power 14 and 6.02 into 10 power 19. See here, we have introduced a 10 power minus 4 mole percent of strontium chloride. There is nothing but 10 power minus 4 divided by 100 into Avogadro number, because the given is mole percent, one mole is nothing but Avogadro number. So, if you simplify that, we will get 6.023 into 10 power 17, means that we are introducing a 6.023 into 10 power 17 strontium ions into the lattice. Then we have to calculate how many cationic vacancies per mole will be. See here, as you know, one strontium ion can replace two sodium ions, but out of the two sites, only one site will be occupied by strontium ion and one site will be vacant. That means that how many strontium ions we are introducing into the lattice? Same number of cationic vacancies will be there in the lattice. 
So, number of cationic vacancies is nothing but number of strontium ions introduced into the lattice, which is nothing but 6.023 into 10 power 17. So, our answer is the second option, this is the correct answer here. Dear students, now we are going to discuss about uh, the chapter solutions. Now, let us see the synopsis in brief. Solution, it is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. In solution, the compound which is in large amounts is a solvent and small amounts is solute. The solution containing only two components is called binary solution. The solution contains maximum amount of dissolved solute is called a saturated, which contains a less than that is called unsaturated solution. So, different types of solutions, solid solutions, liquid solutions and gaseous solutions. And here in detail, I give the different types of solutions with examples. And come to the next one, methods to express the amount of solute in a solution. Mass percentage, it is the mass of solute present in 100 grams of solution. Volume percentage, it is the volume of solute present in 100 ml of solution. Mass to volume percentage, it is the mass of solute present in 100 ml of solution. Parts per million, it is the number of parts by mass of a solute present in million parts by mass of solution. Mole fraction, it is the ratio of number of moles of one component to the total number of moles of all components in the solution. And next one is molarity, it is the number of moles of solute dissolved in one liter of solution and this is the formula which is used to calculate molarity which is weight by molecular weight into 1000 by volume in ml and this molarity is temperature dependent. By changing temperature molarity changes, that is by increasing temperature volume increases, thereby molarity decreases. And come to the next one, molality, it is the number of moles of solute dissolved in 1 kg of solvent and this is the temperature independent because by changing temperature, the mass of a substance cannot changes. So, it is uh, independent on temperature and this is the best method for expressing the concentration of a solution. And next one, solubility. See the solubility of solid sifidic, it mainly depends on four different factors, nature of solute, nature of solvent, temperature and pressure. See when a solid dissolves in a solute endothermically, according to Lee Chatelier principle, as temperature increases, solubility increases. The same if solid dissolves in a exothermically according to Lee Chatelier principle, as temperature increases, solubility decreases. Pressure has no effect on solubility of uh, solids because uh, solids and liquids are incompressible. And coming to the solubility of gases and liquids, it mainly depends on nature of gas, nature of liquid, temperature and pressure. And for this uh, solubility of gases in uh, liquids, we can explain based on Henry's law, which is nothing but. At a given temperature, the partial vapor pressure of a gas is directly proportional to mole fraction of the gas, sorry, in the solution, then P is equal to kH into X and this kH value is different for different gases. As uh, temperature increases, kH value increases, kH is less for more soluble gases and more for less soluble gases. And this entry slice is applicable only at low temperature, uh, where gases cannot react with solvents. And the temperature should not be too high. And next one, Raoult's law of volatile liquids. So, according to this, the partial vapor pressure of each component in the solution is directly proportional to its mole fraction. If the solution contains two components A and B, then P A is equal to P naught A X A, P B is equal to P naught B X B and the total pressure of solution is equal to sum of the partial pressures according to Dalton's law. Then we can get the equation. Uh, pressure of solution is equal to P naught A X A plus P naught B X B and the same equation we can also modify like this. And if you want to calculate the mole fraction of the component gaseous fish which is taken as Y A and Y B and the relation is uh, P A is equal to Y A into P S whereas P B is equal to Y B into P S. Based on this relation we can calculate mole fraction of component gaseous fish. And there are types of solutions, ideal and non-ideal solutions. The solution which obeys Raoult's law is called ideal solution, which does not obey Raoult's law is called non-ideal solution. They can show negative deviation as well as positive deviation. Means, in a non-ideal solution with negative deviation, the total pressure will be less than expected value 
whereas in a non ideal solution with positive deviation they can shows more value than expected value in case of ideal solution delta v mixture and delta h mixture both are zero in case of uh, negative deviation both are negative in case of positive deviation both are positive the reason is that in solution the interaction between ab is more than in co pure component liquids aa and bb then this shows negative deviation if the interaction between a and b is less than in pure components then they can show positive deviation and this is the graphical representation which indicates uh, ideal and non ideal solutions the first one indicates ideal solution second one indicates non ideal solution with positive deviation third one indicates non ideal solution with negative deviation and these are some examples what are given here for a ideal non ideal with which shows positive as well as negative deviation and come to the colligative properties see the properties of the solution which depends on nature of number of solid particles but not on the nature of a solute or solvent are called uh, colligative properties and these colligative properties are relative lowering of vapor pressure elevation of boiling point depression in freezing point and osmotic pressure let us come to uh, one by one raoul's law according to this raoul's law relative lowering of vapor pressure containing a non volatile solute is equal to mole fraction of solute and the relation is uh, p not minus p by p not is equal to n by n plus capital n where small n is number of moles of solute capital n is number of moles of solvent and in case of a very dilute solution what the number of moles of solute in denominator this we can neglect the equation can be modified as p not minus p by p not is equal to n by capital n and this we can represent like this small w by small m into capital m by capital w this is regarding a uh, raoul's law and come to the next one elevation in boiling point so this is the graphical representation of which can shows elevation in boiling point so this is the boiling point of a solution this is the boiling point of a solution and x is nothing but boiling point of solvent so a solution always boils at lower sorry higher temperature than compared to solvent because when a non volatile solute is added to a solvent its vapor pressure decreases so the solution boils at a higher temperature than compared to a solvent now the difference between the boiling points of a solution and solvent is nothing but called as elevation of boiling point that is directly proportional to molality and we can equalize them by multiplying with a constant called kb which is nothing but molal elevation constant and if you substitute the uh, formula for uh, molality then we can get this relation delta tb is equal to kb into w2 by m2 into 1000 by w1 and from this we can calculate the the molecular mass of unknown solute by this following relation where the value of kb can be calculated by the relation rt square by 1000 lv or rt square m by 1000 delta h vaporization so this is regarding elevation of boiling point similarly coming to the depression in freezing point see this is the graph which shows uh, the freezing of a liquid at this temperature there is a sharp change in uh, vapor pressure of solution means that at this temperature liquid is converted to solid so this is the this is tf this is the freezing point of pure solvent uh, when a solution containing non volatile solute is taken the vapor pressure is less so the solution will freezes at uh, a lower temperature than compared to a solvent now this is the freezing point for a uh, solution there is a difference between the freezing point of a uh, solution and solvent which is called as delta tf and here also delta tf is proportional to molality and we can equalize that by multiplying a constant which is called kf so delta tf is equal to kf into m and if you substitute the relation for molality then delta tf is equal to kf into w2 by m2 into 1000 by w1 and from this we can calculate the molecular mass of an unknown solute by this relation and this is the relation which is used to calculate uh, kf which is not more called as a cryoscopic constant or is also called as a molal depression constant and come to the next one osmotic pressure see the flow of solvent molecules from a solvent into solution through a semi permeable membrane is called osmosis 
in order to prevent the flow of solvent molecules into solution from the solvent through semi permeable membrane we should have to apply sudden pressure over the solution the minimum pressure that is required in order to prevent the flow of solvent molecules into solution through semi permeable membrane is nothing more called as osmotic pressure so we can define this as the external pressure applied on the solution to prevent osmosis through semi permeable membrane is called osmotic pressure experimental evidence shows that the osmotic pressure is directly proportional to molarity as well as osmotic pressure is directly proportional to temperature so pi is proportional to temperature and concentration and we can equalize this by multiplying the constant r which is nothing but uh, called solution constant which is numerically equal to gas constant and the value of r is nothing but 0.081 liter atmosphere per mole per kelvin so here pi is equal to crt c is nothing but molarity which is nothing but number of moles by volume in liters then pi v is equal to nrt this is the relation which is used to calculate osmotic pressure and the number of moles is nothing but a molecular mass of solute by molecular sorry mass of solute by molecular mass of solute then we can calculate molecular mass of solute by using the relation m2 is equal to w2rt by pi v and coming to one more important feature the isotonic solutions these are also called as isoosmotic solutions two or more solutions having same osmotic pressure are called isotonic solutions that means uh, pi1 is equal to pi2 so pi1 is c1rt pi2 is equal to c2rt if you cancel rt and rt here the remaining is c1 is equal to c2 c1 is nothing but molarity w2 by m2 into 1000 by w1 and c2 also molarity so here you can cancel 1000 by w1 and 1000 by w1 the remaining is w2 by m2 for first one is equal to w2 by m2 for second one and now come to the next one abnormal molar mass so when a solute undergo dissociation or association then we can observe abnormality in colligative properties that is the colligative property is more than expected value since when a solute undergo dissociation number of solute particles are increased so colligative property increases when a solute undergo dissociation the colligative property will be decreased so in order to avoid this confusion uh, the scientist van't half introduced a new factor which is represented as i and this van't half factor we can calculate by using the relation uh, i is equal to absolute colligative property by normal colligative property otherwise number of particles after dissociation or association by number of particles before dissociation or association otherwise normal molecular weight by absolute molecular weight so by introducing the van't half factor we can modify the colligative properties like this this is the modified relations by introducing van't half factor and one more important feature here is the van't half factor depends upon the degree of dissociation when a solute undergo dissociation the relation between van't half factor and the degree of dissociation is alpha is equal to i minus 1 by n minus 1 similarly if a solute undergo association then the relation between van't half factor and degree of association is alpha is equal to 1 minus i by 1 minus 1 by n so this is regarding synopsis now we will go to the one by one question come to the first one how many grams of concentrated nitric acid solution should be used to prepare 250 ml of Two molar HNO3 solution. Given that the concentration of the acid is uh, 70% HNO3, the options are 70 grams, 54 grams, 45 grams, 90 grams. So here we have to calculate how many grams of nitric acid required to prepare the given concentrated solution of 250 ml. So first apply the molarity formula. and calculate the mass of hno3 required the formula to calculate molarity is m is equal to mass of solute by molecular mass of solute into 1000 by volume of solution since given 
the molarity is 2 molar and the volume is 250 ml and the molecular mass of uh, HNO3 is uh, here 63. If you substitute these three values, we can get mass 63 by 2. So, this uh, 63 by 2 grams of uh, HNO3 required is a uh, 100 percent pure substance, but the given concentrated solution is nothing but 70 percent only. So, now we have to calculate how many grams of 70 percent HNO3 is required, 70 percent given, so 70 by 100 into required mass is 63 by 2, which is nothing but 45 grams. So, the third option is the correct answer here. Now, coming to the second question, what is the mole fraction of solute in a 1 molal aqueous solution? The given is 1 molal aqueous solution means that 1 mole of solute is present in 1000 grams of water. So, number of moles of solute is 1, mass of solvent is 1000 grams. As you know, mole fraction is equal to number of moles of one component by total number of moles. So, this is the number of moles of solute divided by number of moles of solute plus 1000 by 18 mass by molecular mass of water. This gives number of moles of water. Then on simplifying, you can get a 1 by 56.5 which is equal to 0 0.0177. So, our answer is third option. Coming to the next question, 250 ml of Na2CO3 solution containing 2.65 grams of Na2CO3, 10 ml of this solution is added to external water to obtain 0 0.001 m Na2CO3 solution. The value of x is, yeah, the first the given condition is 250 ml of Na2CO3 solution contains 2.65 grams of Na2CO3. Now, volume of solution is 250 ml, mass of solute is 2.65 grams. By using this volume and mass of solute, first we will calculate a molarity of the solution by applying molarity formula. So, here given mass is 2.65 grams, molecular mass of sodium carbonate is 106, the volume of solution given is 250 ml and simplifying we can get 0 0.1 molar. This is the first part. Now, this 0 0.1 molar solution by taking 10 ml that is added to x ml, that means the total volume becomes 10 plus x. Initial volume is 10, final volume is 10 plus x. Initial concentration is 0 0.1, final concentration is 0 0.001. So, now here apply dilution law, which is nothing but m 1 v 1 is equal to m 2 v 2. So, by substituting m 1 v 1, m 2 and v 2 values, here we will get a x value 990 ml. That means, the volume of water added is equal to 990 ml. So, the answer is second option. Come to the next one. The volumes of two HCl solutions having concentration 0 0.5 m and 0 0.1 m to be mixed for preparing 2 liters of 0 0.2 m HCl are. Now, here the total volume of solution is 2 liters. The volume of uh, either A or B are not given. So, let uh, the volume of A is x liters first then what is the remaining volume? 2 minus x liters, that is the volume of B. So, volume of A is equal to x liters, volume of B is equal to 2 minus x liters. The concentration of A given is 0 0.5 and concentration of B given is 0 0.1. Now, apply dilution law. When two solutions of different volumes and different concentrations are mixed, the relation is m a v a plus m v v b is equal to m into v a plus v b. Now, by substituting all these values m a v a m b v b and on simplifying, we will get uh, x is equal to 0 0.5 liters. That means, the volume of a is 0 0.5 liters and the remaining volume that is 1.5 liters is volume of b. 
So, in order to prepare the required solution, we have to mix 0 0.2 liter, sorry, 0 0.5 liters of A and 1.5 liters of B. So, our answer is the first option. Coming to the next one. The value of Henry's constant K H is See, the value of uh, Kh depends on the nature of the gas. See, if the given gas is more soluble, the value of Kh is less. If the given gas is less soluble, the value of Kh is more. Since, at a given temperature, pressure remains constant. If the value of Kh is more, hex value is less. Means that, for less soluble gases, the value, as x decreases, Kh value increases means less soluble gases has more K H value, more soluble gases has less K H value. Now, let us see the options here. Greater for gases with a higher solubility, this is the wrong one, because if solubility is more, Henry's constant will be less. Second one, greater for gases with a lower solubility, so this statement is correct, because if solubility is less, then uh, Henry's constant will be more. Come to the third one, constant for all gases, this is the wrong statement. See the Henry's constant even not same for the same gas, at a different temperatures the, the KH value is different and given fourth option is not related to solubility of the gas. Now, only we discussed KH value is related to X, so the fourth statement also wrong. So, our answer is greater for gases with lower solubility. Come to the next question. Henry's law constant for the solubility of N2 gas in water at 298 Kelvin is 1.0 into 10 power 5 atmospheres. The mole fraction of N2 in air is 0 0.8. The number of moles of N2 from the air dissolved in 10 moles of water at 298 Kelvin and 5 atmospheres is. See here, we have to calculate the solubility of nitrogen gas in water, means we have to apply here the Henry's law. So, in order to apply the Henry's law, first of all, you should know what is the number of moles of nitrogen gas dissolved in water. So, here the mole fraction of nitrogen given in air is 0 0.8 and the total pressure of the gas given is 5 atmospheres. From that, first I will calculate uh, what is the pressure exerted by the nitrogen gas. So, as you know partial pressure is equal to mole fraction into total pressure. Mole fraction of nitrogen is 0 0.8, total pressure given is 5, then the pressure exerted by the nitrogen gas is 4 atmospheres. Now, I will apply Henry's law, P is equal to K H into X, it implies X is equal to P by K H. So, here we got a pressure of nitrogen gas is 4 atmosphere. So, pressure P is equal to 4 atmospheres and Henry's constant given is 1 into 10 power 5. So, I have substituted K H value 1 into 10 power 5 here and on simplifying I will get 4 into 10 power minus 5. This is the mole fraction of nitrogen. So, the formula for a mole fraction of nitrogen I have represented here number of moles of nitrogen by number of moles of nitrogen plus number of moles of water. Since nitrogen is less soluble in water, the number of moles of nitrogen in denominator is very less, so we can neglect this. Then the relation becomes 4 into 10 power minus 5 is equal to number of moles of nitrogen by number of moles of water, this is the relation. Since given there is a 10 moles of water, so substitute a 10 in place of number of moles of water, then we will get a number of moles of nitrogen as 4 into 10 power minus 4. So, among the given options, the correct option is 1 into 10 power minus 4. So, overall in this problem, first we have calculated the pressure of the nitrogen gas and from the pressure we have calculated the mole fraction of the nitrogen gas. And then from the mole fraction of the nitrogen gas, we have calculated number of moles of nitrogen gas in three stages. Coming to the next question. H 
Henry's law constant for the gas at a 298 Kelvin is 100 kilo bar. If the gas exerts a partial pressure of 1 bar, the number of millimoles of the gas dissolved in 1 liter of the water is and this is also based on uh, Henry's law. As you know that P is equal to KH index, then mole fraction is equal to pressure by KH. The given pressure is 1 bar. So, P is equal to 1 bar and Henry's law constant given is 100 kilo bar, kilo means 1000. So, 100 kilo bar means 100 into 1000 which is equal to 10 power 5. So, we have taken here uh, 100 into 10 cube bars. So, we got a uh, KH value as uh, 10 power minus 5. So, mole fraction x is equal to number of moles of x by number of moles of x plus number of moles of water. Since number of moles of x is less here as compared to number of moles of water. So, we can neglect this nx value in denominator. Now, so, the relation is 10 power minus 5 is equal to number of moles of x divided by number of moles of water. How you will get number of moles of water here? So, here we have taken a 1 liter of water. The mass of 1 liter of water is nothing but equal to 1000 grams. Then number of moles is equal to mass by molecular mass that is 1000 by 18. Then on simplifying this, we will get n value. 55.5 into 10 power minus 5 moles, convert this into millimoles, then we can get 0 0.55 millimoles. So, our answer is first option. Come to the next one. A solution containing components A and B shows positive deviation from Raoult's law when? See, if you take a two component liquids A, A, B, B, these are the two component liquids. When you mix A and B, we have to break these bonds and then attractions develop between A and B. Here asked is positive deviation. See, whenever in a solution, the attractive forces between the component molecules that is A and B are less than compared in a pure component liquids, then the solution can show positive deviation. That is, if the attractive forces in the solution are less than compared to attractive forces in pure components A, A and B, B, then the solution can show positive deviation. So, here among the given options, the first one is A, B attraction forces are greater than A, A and B, B. So, in this case, the solution can show negative deviation, but not positive deviation. A B attraction force is same as A and B B. In attractive forces between component molecules before mixing and after mixing is same, then this is a ideal solution. The attractive forces between A and B is less than A and B B, then it can show a positive deviation. And come to the fourth one volume of solution is equal to sum of the volumes of A and B, then this is also an ideal solution. So, among the given options, the third option is the correct one. Come to the next one. Which of the following is incorrect for ideal solution? The given options are delta H mixture is equal to 0, delta U mixture is equal to 0, delta V mixture is equal to 0, delta S mixture is equal to 0. See, in case of uh, ideal solutions, we know that delta H mixture is equal to 0. There is no change in enthalpy during mixing and delta V mixture is also equal to 0 because during mixing, there is no change in volume. So, delta V mixture also 0. As you know, delta H is equal to delta U plus delta N R T. Otherwise, delta H is equal to delta U plus P delta V. Since here, there is no change in volume, this term equal to 0. Since this is equal to 0, delta H is equal to delta U. As we discussed now, delta H is equal to 0. So, delta U also equal to 0. 
now coming to delta S mixture. See when two solutions are mixed, the total volume of the solution increases, the distance between the constant particles increases, that is randomness of the system increases. If randomness of the system is increased, then delta S is not equal to 0, that is delta S is greater than 0. So, the correct answer is delta S greater than 0, but here given option is delta S mixture is equal to 0. So, delta X mixture is equal to 0 is the incorrect for ideal solutions. So, our answer is fourth option and come to the next one. The vapor pressure of two liquids P and Q are 80 and 60 torrs respectively. The total vapor pressure of solution obtained by mixing 3 moles of P and 2 moles of Q would be, the options are 72 torrs, 140 torrs, 68 torrs and 20 torrs. See this is a binary liquid solution. According to Rolle's law for a binary liquid solution, the total pressure of the solution is equal to sum of the partial pressures. And here given, the pressures of the pure components 80 and 60 torrs respectively. So, P naught P is equal to 80 torrs and P naught Q is equal to 60 torrs. Number of moles of P is equal to 3 and number of moles of uh, Q is equal to 2. Now, if you substitute all these uh, 4 values in this uh, relation, then we can get pressure of P is 80, number of moles of P 3, total number of moles is 3 plus 2, pressure of Q is 60, number of moles of Q is equal to 20 and total number of moles is 3 plus 2, 5 and if you simplify this, we will get uh, the total pressure of the system as a 72 torrs. So, our answer is first option. Next one, a solution has 1 is to 4 mole ratio of pentane to hexane. The vapor pressure of pure pentane is 440 mm and hexane is 120 mm. What is the mole fraction of pentane in vapor phase? Right. So, here the system contains a 1 is to 4 mole ratio of pentane to hexane, means number of moles of pentane is 1 and number of moles of hexane is equal to 4. First, I will calculate a mole fraction of pentane, that is 1 by 1 plus 4, which is equal to 1 by 5. The mole fraction of a hexane, which is 4 by 1 plus 4, that is 4 by 5. Then according to Rolle's law, total the pressure of the component is equal to pure component vapor pressure into mole fraction. Then pure component vapor pressure for uh, pentane is 440 and its mole fraction is 1 by 5 and if you simplify that you will get 88. Similarly, we can calculate for uh, hexane. The pure component vapor pressure of hexane is 120 and mole fraction of hexane is 4 by 5 and on simplifying this we will get 96. So, pressure of pentane is 88, pressure of hexane is 96. Then according to Dalton's law, mole fraction of C5 H12 in vapor phase is equal to partial pressure of pentane divided by partial pressure of hexane plus partial pressure of pentane nothing but total pressure. So, the pressure of uh, pentane is 88 and uh, hexane is 96 by substituting this and on simplifying we can get 0 0.478. So, the answer is uh, fourth option 0 0.478 is our correct answer. Now, coming to the next one. An aqueous solution is 1 molal in Ki which change will cause the vapor pressure of solution to increase. See, the vapor pressure is directly proportional to mole fraction of solvent and inversely proportional to number of moles of solid particles. In a given solution, if the number of solute particles are increased, that means the concentration of the solute increases, the vapor pressure decreases. If the solute particles are decreased per unit volume, then vapor pressure of solution increases. Here the asked question is, an aqueous solution is 1 molal in Ki, 
which change will cause the vapor pressure of the solution to increase. So, vapor pressure of solution should be increased. So, vapor pressure should be increased. That means, mole fraction of solute should be decreased. So, it, the given solution concentration is uh, 1 molal. Now, to the solution, if I add a con solution which is having more concentration than to it, then number of solute particles per unit volume increases. That means, the value of x increases. If value of x increases, vapor pressure decreases. So, in case of uh, first one, second one and third one, by adding these, number of solute particles per unit volume may increase or may remain same. So, in case of first one, number of moles of solute particles of NaCl similar to 1 molal K solution, there is no change in vapor pressure. But in case of second and third option, the concentration of the solution what we added is more than the given concentration. So, the resultant concentration increases as concentration increases, the vapor pressure decreases. Now, coming to the fourth one, addition of water. When water is added, the concentration of solution decreases, that is the mole fraction of solute decreases. As a result here, the vapor pressure increases. So, the answer is addition of water will increase the vapor pressure. Now, come to the next one mass of glucose that would be dissolved in 50 grams of water to produce the same lowering of vapor pressure as produced by dissolving 1 gram of urea in the same quantity of water. So, here the lowering of vapor pressure produced is same, lowering of vapor pressure as produced should be same. That means, delta P of glucose and delta P of urea should be same. If delta P is same, then mole fractions will be same. If mole fractions are same, then number of moles of the components will be same. So, delta P glucose is equal to delta P urea x, that is mole fraction of glucose is equal to mole fraction of urea and mole fraction of uh, there is number of moles of glucose is equal to number of moles of urea. Number of moles is nothing but mass by molecular mass. So, mass of glucose we have to calculate. Molecular mass of glucose is 180, mass of urea given is 1 and molecular mass of urea is 60 and if on simplifying we will get a mass of glucose required is 3 grams. That is 3 grams of glucose when dissolved we will get the same lowering in vapor pressure as when 1 gram of urea is dissolved in 50 grams of water. So, our answer is second option. And coming to the next one. Lowering of vapor pressure due to a solution in 1 molal aqueous solution at 100 degree Celsius is. Here, the given solution is 1 molal solution and the temperature given is 100 degree Celsius. Vapor pressures are not given, but we know that 100 degree Celsius is the boiling point of water. That is the temperature at which vapor pressure becomes equal to an atmosphere. Means that the vapor pressure of water at 100 degree Celsius is equal to an atmosphere, which is nothing but equal to 760 mm of mercury. And the molality of solution given is uh, 1 molal, means that 1 mole of solute is present in 1000 grams of water. So, now if we calculate the mole fraction of solute, 1 mole of solute is present in 1000 grams of water. So, number of moles of water is equal to 1000 by 18 and on simplifying this, we will get mole fraction of solute as 0 0.0. 176. According to Raoul's law, we know that P naught minus P by P naught, which is a relative lowering of vapor pressure is equal to mole fraction of solute. Then, if you take P naught to here, then P naught minus P becomes equal to P naught into mole fraction of solute. The P naught is 
760 mm of mercury and mole fraction of solute what we calculated is 0 0.0176 and on multiplication of both these values we will get 13.4 millimeters. So, the lowering of vapor pressure is nothing but 13.4 mm of Sg and the first option is the correct answer. Next one, the mass of a non-volatile solute uh, which should be dissolved in 114 grams of octane to reduce its vapor pressure to 80 percent will be. So, vapor pressure is reduced to 80 percent. So, let the initial pressure is 100 because percentage is given and final pressure is 80 and mass of octane given here 1.114 grams of octane and we have to calculate the mass of non-volatile solute. Now, by substituting these values in a Raoult's law, first we will calculate a mole fraction of solute that is 1000 minus 80 by 100 gives 0 0.2. So, mole fraction of solute is 0 0.2, then mole fraction of solvent will be 1 minus 0 0.2 because sum of the mole fractions is equal to 1. So, mole fraction of solvent is 0 0.8. Then I will take the relation for mole fraction of solvent. Mole fraction of solvent is equal to moles of solvent by moles of solvent plus solute. By substituting the values here, if you simplify, you will get mass of uh, octane which is required, which is equal to 10 grams. So, our answer is 10 grams. Third option is the correct answer. Next one, 3 grams of urea is dissolved in 45 grams of water. The relative lowering of vapor pressure is so, according to Raoult's law, we know that relative lowering of vapor pressure is equal to mole fraction of solute, nothing but number of moles of solute by number of moles of solute plus solvent. Number of moles of solute mass by molecular mass, 3 grams mass, 60 molecular mass divided by number of moles of solute and 45 is the mass of water and molecular mass of water is 18. By substituting this, if you simplify, you will get a 0 0.02. So, our answer is the third option. And next one, an aqueous solution freezes at uh, minus 0 0.186 degree Celsius. The elevation of boiling point of the solution is Kf values and Kb values are given. So, here we can solve this in uh, two different methods. The first one is delta Tf is equal to T naught F minus Tf freezing point of water is 0 and the elevation in freezing point of solution is 0 0.186. Then if you take the difference between those, we can get differential in freezing point. By substituting this differential in freezing point in this formula delta T f is equal to K f into m, we will get a molality 0 0.1 m. Now, by using this molality, we can calculate a elevation in boiling point. As you know that, delta T b is equal to K b into m, K b value is given here, molality we have calculated here, by substituting uh, K b value and molality value, we can get delta T b value which is 0 0.0512. The same problem we can solve in an alternate method by an easy method, which is nothing but the relation between delta T b and delta T f is delta T b by delta T f is equal to K b by K f. So, here K b value, K f values are given delta T f is known. So, by substituting these values directly in this relation and on simplifying, we can get uh, 0 0.0512. So, the answer is fourth option. And next one, which of the following solutions will exhibit a highest boiling point? See, the elevation in boiling point delta T b is equal to I into K b into m. The elevation of boiling point mainly depends on Van t Hoff factor and molality of the solution. The product of these two can decide the elevation in boiling point. The solution which is having highest value of uh, I into M has the highest boiling point, where I is Van t Hoff factor which is nothing but number of ions produced from one molecule. So, if you take KTSO4 Van t Hoff factor is 3 and given molality is 0 0.01 the number of moles of particles is 0 0.03. For KNO3, Van t Hoff factor is 2 and molality given is 0 0.01, the number of moles of particles is 0 0.02. For 
per urea it is not non electrolyte so van't hoff factor is 1 so number of moles of particles is 0 0.015 glucose is also non electrolyte so van't hoff factor is 1 number of moles of particles is 0 0.015 now among all these K2SO4 contains more number of solid particles. As the number of solid particles increases, elevation of boiling point increases. So, the answer is K2SO4. So, the first option is the answer. So, this is in brief regarding uh, the solid state and solutions chapters. Thank you one and all.